what is a macro? A macro is a technique to perform reusable source-to-source -source transformation. The objective is to extend the language semantics. So you can think of it as basically a compiler pass uh, that the user is allowed to extend. So you'll have your racket code and there will be a way to describe uh, how to transform that code, maybe to generate something or to emit something. We're going to see a few examples of how to use the macro system to generate code in Racket. Generally, when we talk about a macro system, or when we talk about macros, we actually are talking about three different things. One is defining the macro itself, where you have some sort of language that is able to talk about source code and how to transform that source code. There is the macro system, which is the language used to describe these transformations. Um, and finally, you have the macro expansion, which is essentially the problem, the, the process of applying the, the macro system on your code. So generally, macro expansions occur before the code is run. And compiled. So basically it's a pass after your code is parsed that is understood, converted from text into a, stru a logical structure. There is then a pass that use, calls the macro system uh, to expand uh, certain macro de declarations and so on. So things that we've we've actually have seen macros uh, once I introduced the do notation. Right. So over there, we actually copy-pasted a macro. We didn't really care about what was going on there. We simply used it as syntactic sugar for the bind operator, where we want to combine two things and we want to hide a lambda there. And we use the notation to kind of hide the lambda somewhere behind um, some code transformation. Uh, there are simpler cases where, for instance, I might want to write a macro that hides code, as I can, as, as I will show you how to define a macro that you can just comment out code or things like that. So there are multiple uses of of macros, and we're going to see in today's lecture we're going to see good uses and bad uses, why you should and why you should not use macros, and we're going to cover talk about a few use cases where. Where are macros used in practice? Why should they be used? When should they be avoided? And so on. So macros that are actually used quite extensively in the Racket standard library. They can be used to encode in fixed notation. They can be used to encode alternative evaluation methods, such as lazy evaluation, or as we saw, monadic evaluation. They can be used generally to generate boilerplate code. So whenever you have repetitive um, code generation, they are usually um, they're usually used. Macros are used in that sense, where you are generating some code that is always follows a certain pattern. Uh, they can also be used to encode different programming models, such as as we've seen monads or object-oriented programming. Uh, for instance, the generics that we've seen underlying, there is macros being used there. Uh, so they're, they're used quite a lot to introduce different paradigms in the same programming language. So where are macros used in, in practice? So records are not specific to record. Uh, in fact, macros are used in C, for instance, quite widely used in C. They are used in C++ as well, um, in Racket, of course, and all the Lisp family. So Clojure also uses uh, macros. There are different kinds of macros, as we will see. Some are a bit more robust than others. Rust is very famous for their uh, good use of macros. OCaml as well, surprising. I don't know if you are aware of OCaml, but in OCaml there's also a, a macro system. And generally, Macros, for instance, one very nice use of macros is for serialization, um, where you want to maybe have a data structure and you want to map that data structure to to um, 
a JSON parser or XML parser, you want to be able to generate automatically a parser from a description. You want to be able to generate the parser at compile time because you can optimize the generated code. Whereas if you try to do it at runtime, um, it could be slower because you would have to compute both the parser and then the code that handles it. So for languages that are that have type systems, having a Mac like OCaml or Rust, having a, a macro system that is able to generate code with respect to certain data types, that is quite helpful. You have whenever you have serialization, which happens when you're manipulating JSON XML, but also when you're manipulating like RPC systems, remote procedure calls, it's very common to have some macro system. When you don't, what usually happens is that you will have some manual code generation process where, you know, if you are using Java, which does not have um, a macro system, what generally happens is that you have a file and you have to run a command that will generate some Java code that you will ignore. You will not look at what that code does, but you will use it regardless. So this code generation aspect is can be integrated in, like in the, the programming language by means of macros. And when you don't have that, basically you have a tool that generates code. So the remote procedure call that I was talking about, this is very common. Boilerplate generation. So whenever you have some things that you, for instance, if you have um, Java code and you need to call C code, there's a lot of boilerplate code generation that it always has to follow the same pattern. Um, in many languages, you have to use, um, as I was saying, code generators or even write it by hand. With a macro system, you could generate that code automatically. So for instance, if you want OCaml to interact with JavaScript or with C, uh, the fact that the language has a macro system will greatly simplify. You know, you can have an extension of the programming language with just some annotations that underneath are generating code that will handle um, convert data types from one language to the other, let's say. So in the next video, we're going to cover a bit the problems of using macro systems.